Um, welcome to the 23-24 academic year. Am I right? Time flies by. Um, I'm so happy. This so you're here. For those of you who are new to the department, this is room 611. We have informatic seminar series not every single Friday, but many Fridays of the quarter. And this is where they'll be. And usually you have somebody up here who's like coming from elsewhere or else from our own department, but they're telling you about their research and their activities and the kind of the exciting kind of scholarly pursuits that they're engaged in. This is not that. <laughs> this is me as your department chair. I'm Melissa Mazmanian. This is a talk that's about us. So like it's about us and about us. So this is the kind of state of where we are as a department, what individuals have been up to, I will tell you that I do a lot of things as department chair, 90% of which none of you ever have to see, hopefully. But this is the one that's the most fun. So putting together these slides, really getting to kind of go deep into what different people have been up to. This is really only a smattering of some of the things that you're happening in the department, but it's so like fulfilling for me because we really are surrounded by some of the most interesting people and a chance to stand back and see what you all have been up to just kind of, I don't know, starts me off on a good start for the year and makes me really appreciate being part of this department. So we're gonna go through an overview. Many of you know who I'm gonna bring up and the people to know, but for those of you who are new to our community, I wanna remind you of kind of who are the different people in different positions, both at the university level, the school level, and our department level that you should keep an eye out for and know what they're doing? Then I'm going to give you some, actually, most like school news, not campus news, uh, a lot of department news, a little bit about our structure, and some thoughts about the year ahead. So who here understands how a research university works? And it's funny because I was describing this to my nine-year-old yesterday. Because he was like, well, who's in charge? I'm like, not me, don't worry. Um, the person who's actually fundamentally in charge of the University of California Irvine is Chancellor Howard Gilman. He's been in this role for a while. He is the outward, the outward presence of our university. He is incredibly engaging. Have any of you had a chance to meet Howard? He is the most engaging, like thoughtful, kind of external, he, you just you just talk to him and you get excited about education. And that is the job of a chancellor. So they are the outward face of the institution. They communicate with industry, they communicate with other leaders, they communicate with those in Sacramento, and they're really supposed to raise the profile of the University of California Irvine. And I think Howard does an excellent job at that. But then there are the people who run the university. And this is Hal Stern. He is our provost and executive vice chancellor. He makes all the hard decisions about how this university works, how we weather successfully different budget cycles up and down. Um, when I first came to UCI in 2009, right after I came, Hal became our dean here in ICS. And he weathered us through the 2009 to 11 recession and budget crisis in a wonderful, honest, transparent, and fiscally responsible way. So I personally really like the house in charge of the whole university. He's just a very smart and wonderful man. So he runs this place. Our decisions are made about budgets. He's the one who has to make them. I think he's probably the hardest working person on campus and I really wouldn't want to be how. <laughs> <laughs> but he has some great people working for him and with him. And these are our vice chancellors. There's one for research, one for IT and data, and one for equity, diversity, inclusion, diversity and inclusion. And actually, I just lied. These people work for Howard. These are the external people, and they're bringing in the thinking about raising our profile for research, thinking about how we run IT and data, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Dion is brand new. She just is coming to the university right now. Reggie gives a thumbs up. Give a thumbs up for Dion. Uh, she's coming from University of Colorado Boulder. She's an excellent, excellent history. She's replacing Doug Haynes, who we did not lose uh, at the university level in any kind of bad way. Doug got elevated and he's now the, um, what's his exact title? But he's the, come on, I have it here. He's the vice provost for academic affairs and uh, at the entire UC system. So he's off doing other things. Okay, so then we have Hal 
And then we have the group of people who help Hal run our university. And these are also very hardworking people and I also wouldn't want to be them. But we have Dean Jillian Hayes. Any of you know this face and name? Some of you work directly with Dean Hayes. I see some hands in the background. Uh, Jillian is actually coming from our department. She and I shared, we didn't share offices, but we shared a wall for the first few years I was here. Um, and I learned a lot because she talks loudly so we could hear. <laughs> but I learned a lot, actually. She's a, she is currently in the role of Vice Provost of Graduate Education. If any concerns, fears, issues, challenges that face our graduate students, which there have been maybe a few, um, she's like number, number one in charge. And I can tell you from a personal perspective that she is absolutely one of the most hardworking and caring people. She has to make hard decisions as well. Um, you know, those decisions could be interpreted any way you want, but she truly cares about graduate students. Then we have Dean Michael Denon, who is the same, does the same thing that Jillian does, but for undergraduate students. Also been a lot of challenges in the last few years. Um, Dean Dallant Denon does not come from our school or department, but we still like him very much. And actually, we, he is a wonderful, wonderful course. I think I forget anyway, because he comes from physics. Does anyone remember? No, is it physics? physics? Physics, yeah. So he's outstanding and he's doing a lot to transform pedagogy and education for undergrad students in a time of growing numbers and the more and more desires for hybrid learning, but also for active learning, which can be really challenging. So he's doing a bunch on that end. Then we have Diane O'Dowd. She only matters for the faculty in the room, <laughs> but she matters a lot for the faculty in the room. So she is the Vice Provost of Academic Personnel. She actually manages all of our careers, our promotions, the way that our careers, tra our trajectory of career through the institution is all managed by Diane's office. She has the final say actually in whether or not we stay hired and or get promoted. Do you know that? <laughs> then we have uh, Vice Provost Roxy Service. Roxy Silver, and she does, she works with Hal, and she does the, she's the academic planning and institutional research. So she has to do all of the hard work of actually projecting out and seeing how the university is working, like thinking about all of the spreadsheets and numbers to understand our current and future trajectory as an institution. These are real people. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I put this up here is they're real humans. Your university is run by real people who care about you. It doesn't always feel that way because you're also part of a giant bureaucracy, right? And you send out emails and you get told that UC Path didn't work or dropped you from the system or didn't pay your fees. How many of this happened to? Come on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, we have breakdowns as an institution because we are a giant bureaucracy, but we have real people who really care. And I want you to know that because I actually know all these people and I can say personally that they are trying their best to make this institution work for you. So I just want, it's good to remember that. Then you're in a school. You're in the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Science. And that school is currently run by Dean Marius Papamafeu. Say that five times. <laughs> <laughs> he actually uh, goes by Dean Marius and he's absolutely fine with that. He's right around the corner over there. He also cares deeply and is doing an excellent job of running ICS. He was just up for his second term as Dean and uh, I was part of the, the group that was on the, the group to review and assess him. And he got, I mean, just glowing reviews from across campus of what he's doing as a dean for this school. So he's really well respected. He's doing an excellent job. You didn't know I was going to do this, Heike. <laughs> Heike's over here in the corner. I didn't know she's going to come, hi, Heike. But Heike works with Dean Marios. Um, I could not find a better picture of you. Sorry, it's, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but she is the one who actually runs our school. So just like Howard is doing a lot of the big picture for the university, but Hal is running the school, there's a little bit of a similar relationship between our dean and assistant dean. So Heike is technically in charge of all of our staff and operations and really is the one who's running ICS as an organization. We also have a series of associate deans. These are rotating positions held by faculty members. Um, and they they help with a lot of the things. They help Dean Marius understand strategy and implement new programs and think about how are we as a school in terms of our graduate affairs. Many of you know Madhu, some of you work with him. He is our Associate Dean for Graduate Affairs. 
Similarly, we have Gopi, who is our Associate Dean for Undergrad Affairs. He's coming from the Computer Science Department. We have Andre, who just took on the role this year for Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. He actually, again, similar to Diana Dowd, is really focusing on faculty merits and promotion, so we won't have as much intersection with students in this role. But he's doing excellent stuff with students as well. And then we have Rena Decker, who is our Associate Dean for Research. Then we go down a level. We have three departments in this school. And those departments are computer science, statistics, and the reason we're all here, which is mathematics. These are all also rotating positions um, held by faculty members. And these are your current department chairs. So this is Tony, Dan, and you know who that is in the middle. <laughs> and I have to say, they're great. One of the nice things about this current suite of leadership is we really like each other. We go to lunch. We talk about kind of problems and concerns as well as just trying to strategically coordinate between departments. They're outstanding. So I'm really lucky to be able to serve at this moment in time with Tony and Dan. Then I have people helping me. <laughs> and we have three people in the department who are currently in the role of vice chair. And they, many of you have had to intersect with them in one reason or another. They are also outstanding. So we have Bill. Tom is our just our kind of overall vice chair. He handles all of our teaching schedule and working with faculty and a lot of the ins and outs of running the department. Then we have Yunnan Chen over here, and Yunnan is our vice chair for undergrad affairs. She works tirelessly <laughs> to try and help all of our undergraduate students have a positive experience in the school. She works with student affairs. She works with us on kind of streamlining our courses and make sure everything works. Then we have Katie. I hope everybody in this room knows Katie. If not, it's a problem. <laughs> Katie is our vice chair for graduate affairs. So she is the one who intersects with all graduate students. She probably sends you letters of acceptance. She will help you manage any issue that comes up. You can speak to her if you're having a hard day. You can speak to her if you're struggling with your classes. You can speak to her if you're not quite sure how to communicate with your advisor. She is outstanding. So I absolutely recommend getting to know Katie. Then we have Marty Beach. Marty had to run off today that he was going to come because he had a family thing come up. But he runs our department from a staff side. So Marty is outstanding. He's been here for 20 years. He knows this department better than anybody. And he knows the ins and outs of how things work. And he's very good at problem solving and helping you figure out where you need to go. So he's a good first line of defense if you're having a trouble from kind of with your PA assignment, if you're getting keys to your lab, with any number of questions. He also has a series of staff that work in our department that work for and with him. Adriana Avina is an administrative specialist, but she also helps with graduate, graduate student coordination. Stephanie Wang is our events coordinator. So if you are gonna ever be in a position to be helping a faculty member run an event, Stephanie's gonna be helping on the back end. Marissa and Luzanne are department assistants. They matter a lot to you. Because if you wanna get reimbursed <laughs> for something if you travel, if, and your faculty member that you work with has agreed to pay for it. If you do some purchasing, if you are part of IGSA or um, you know, one of our affinity groups and you have a budget that you would like to spend money on, they're the ones who can make all the purchases and help you figure out how to do that smoothly. You're going to be going to one of them depending on who is assigned to your current faculty member. So if you have an advisor, that, that person will tell you which of these two to go to for your purchasing and reimbursements. And then Connie Chang is our program manager for um, our M-Suite, which is our professional master's program in software engineering, which we'll get to later. But also I wanna welcome Kaylin Costa. So Kaylin is just starting in about a week, <laughs> October 9th, but she has officially agreed to take on the role of program manager of our self-supporting professional master's program that is the Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design. Some of you will be or have TA for this program. This is for professionals both of our professional degree programs for professionals who are changing careers or moving up in their career. They, they have their own curriculums. So they don't really intersect with your classes, but you may be asked to TA for them. They're really great programs. So we're super excited to have Kaylin on board. Okay, so also our department has two rotating positions within the department for graduate students. These are funded in the sense that these positions come with a full year of funding. They've been both one. This one has been around since 2017. And we have another one I'll tell you in a second. 
we have a rotating informatics diversity ambassador. Currently, it's Rachel. Um, many some of you have you held this position, or you may hold it in the future. What this job is is that you, this person, is helping us as a department. Okay, first of all, how many of you know what informatics means? Yeah, me too. Okay, <laughs> nobody knows what informatics means, right? It is a really it's a word that elides elides definition on purpose. It is really is a kind of a big tent to bring in people interested in the intersections that are integration of human and technology from every perspective of software engineering, the human computer interaction, to health, to science, technology, and society, right? To education, games, and digital media and learning. That's a lot of pieces. It's not very translatable outside of this department. So what I'm what Rachel's tasked with doing is working with our Office of Equity and Inclusion externally to try and increase our pipeline. And that's a fancy way of saying, get more people to apply. <laughs> so we would like to make sure that we are fostering a diverse student body. But part of what I think one of the roadblocks we face is people not knowing who we are or what we do. So this informatics diversity ambassador is really supposed to be an outward facing position, going to conferences, going to HBCUs or minority serving institutions to help people understand what informatics is to answer questions, to help people navigate the application process. It's an outstanding position. We are the first people on campus to have this as a standard position. And I've been asked by many other departments to give kind of our overview of the position and our kind of what it does. Everybody's excited. It is something they're trying to do much broader in the university, and we're the first. We've also had Mishu in the role of our informatic graduate student host. And this is actually a great, a great position that one of you may want to take. This is also a year-long position. And this person is our outward-facing graduate student. It's very helpful for professional development who intersects with all of our incoming speakers, both in a very practical, coordinated way, but also more substantively giving them tours, getting to know them, taking them around. So it's a way to get to know some people in the external community. They also help with our admissions kind of recruitment and, and kind of any, anytime we have people visiting the apartment and we need a graduate student face, very well that we call them. Okay. We also have a decade mentor. And the decade program is a university-wide program, but we're really very happy it exists. And this is a faculty member whose job it is to make sure that graduate student culture is being attended to. He's not going to make your culture perfect. That's up to you. <laughs> but he is there to brainstorm ideas with you're having any kind of more cultural problems if you feel like you don't have a home here for any reason, Aaron is here. He's a wonderful listener who holds office hours, which are really to just like go get coffee together once, once a week. I don't know. I won't ask for a throw of hands here of who's met with Aaron in the role of decade mentor, but I can promise you that he is really a great resource. And last, but absolutely not least, is IGSA. So IGSA is our informatics graduate student Association. We got through COVID, everyone. But in COVID, we all stayed home, right? It was a very hard time to start a PhD program. Several of you who are in your later years of your PhD started during COVID. It was really hard. Um, coming back from COVID, this is really basically our second, third year back, really has been a real push to remember that we're a community, to remember that we're here together physically, but also kind of socially, culturally, we like to develop the sense that we are a community. One kind of aspect of that is what is it like to be a graduate student in our department? IGSA is of graduate students, by graduate students, and for graduate students. I don't have anything to do with it on purpose. I give you money. If you need more money, ask. That's it. And that's on purpose because we're not here to tell you what kind of graduate student association you should have. We're here for, to help you get the tools and resources to build a wonderful graduate student experience. Um, we had a town hall last year where some of our faculty members came in with our current graduate students and just talked about like what was it like to be a graduate student when I went to school? What did I get out of the graduate commu student community that I was part of? to kind of remind us all of what that can be. Because after COVID, I think we felt all felt a little adrift and the ties between the graduate students were starting to fray as well. 
But with, I don't know if it was our town hall or just a new crop of students or just people being back, but my gosh, IGSA is coming back in force and I'm so happy. So these are the current officers of IGSA. Imani, Mishu, Novia, Christine, and Nareen. You're going to be getting emails from them. As you can see, they do have president and treasurer, but they have two social chairs and a communication chair. And I think that suggests what they're really here for, which is to hang out <laughs> and to have activities that are both social and professional. So join them and bring your friends along. Okay? I mean, you don't have to, because I don't know. Okay, you know, but I would encourage it. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that they're starting up this year is a monthly student speaker series for the faculty in the room. You can attend by invite only. So whoever is speaking has to invite you. Otherwise, get out. This is of students, by students, and for students. They will be sending out more information about that. They're also doing a fall cookie decorating. Oh, this was, let's see, whatever, on October 31st. And they're going to be doing a Friendsgiving as well. So this is just a wonderful reminder. I'm so personally thrilled that our Graduate Student Association is back and vibrant. Okay, I'll take a breath. Let me tell you about some things that are going on in our school. First, uh, coming up in a couple of weeks is the fifth annual industry showcase. This is a big, big moment for those in external relations and the school as a whole, they bring in bunches of companies. It is focused a little bit towards undergrads, but there are special events just for graduate students, master's networking with recruiters and PhD networking with recruiters um, to, on the evening, both Tuesday and Wednesday, October 10th and 11th, both held out there. Come on up, check it out. They have spent the entire year getting a, a fabulous kind of roster of companies and recruiters coming in to get to know our students. It can never hurt to put yourself in front of them. Also, you may have heard that we were given the biggest gift in the school's history last year. So Paul Butterworth and Joe Butterworth, who both went to UCI, Paul in particular talks a lot about how he would not have gone to college without financial support. He was about to not go to college. And a, a fellowship came through or a scholarship came through and changed his life. So now, fast forward many years, he's amassed quite a lot of money, and he's going to give it a lot of it to us. So this is really to support student success and programs. Um, one thing to be to be clear about is it's called an estate gift. We love Paul and Joe. We don't really want anything to happen to them anytime soon. Okay. But we're not going to see that money until something does. <laughs> so this money, we, we're not a rich school today, though actually we're doing quite well. But this is going to be a gift that's going to come to us after they pass away. But it has been established, and at some point it will happen. So you know, let's wish them well. <laughs> this is not a. This can become very dark very quickly. Um, but we do not see this gift until so that's what you know. They say a state gift, and people might not know what that means, right? Because I had a lot of people come be like, oh my gosh, you guys have so much money. I'm like, well, not yet. <laughs> and we really aren't going to wish for it because that would be bad karma. <laughs> um, so, but it's still a wonderful, wonderful, like, a, you know, confidence in the school and a testament to how much we can change people's lives through education. Also, I don't know if you guys know this, but the U.S. News and World Report rankings came. Take them what you will. Those rankings can mean, you know, who knows where they come from with a lot of these rankings, right? Some of us study quantification practices and data, and so we like to have a healthy eye roll about rankings in general, but they don't mean nothing. And I think it's worth shouting to the rooftops that there are literally two and only two undergraduate programs that are ranked in the top 10 of the U.S. News and World Report in all of UCI. Two. That's it. You know what they both are? Both programs are here in informatics. Not the school, in informatics. We are the only two undergraduate programs ranked in all of UCI in the top 10. Number nine in game simulation development and number nine in software engineering. Last year, we were also the only two programs ranked in all of UCI for undergraduate, undergraduate programs in the top 10. It's pretty impressive, right? Well done. 
For those faculty in the room, you might laugh or take a sigh of relief. We are getting, we have a new website. I know. I don't know if many of you have looked at our website in the last five to 10 years. It did not reflect the quality of who we are and the image we wanted to put forth to the world. But this website has been long in coming. So we have been talking about it for, I don't know how many years, but it is live. The new ICS website is live and the updated department websites will be happening hopefully in the next month. It's a big deal for us. Okay, does my mom think it's that big deal? It's a big deal for us. So that's our school news. And now let's get to the fun part, which is all of the interesting things that are happening in the department. First of all, there are two major kind of things that happen in an academic's life. So, well, now, okay, there's a lot of major things that happen in someone's life, but from a career perspective, you come into the job as an assistant professor. And then at some point you get promoted to what we call associate professor. It's a big deal. <laughs> the difference between assistant professor and associate professor is it's something called tenure. And tenure is a classic system in the United States and across many countries, which basically guarantees employment for the rest of your working life, assuming that you are still, you know, you don't do anything horrendous, <laughs> truly horrendous. Tenure is to preserve academic freedom. It doesn't mean we stop working. It doesn't mean we get become lazy. I can promise you, you'll see from the rest of these slides that our tenured professors are not lazy. They are not not working. They're not sitting on their tenure and doing nothing. They are incredibly productive and exciting people. But what it means is they have the freedom to study what they want. You don't have to be at the slave of the capitalistic enterprise in terms of what you think is worth researching. I personally believe in tenure as an institution. I think it is a gift and that society needs people who have the freedom to do long-term trajectories of research, to think things that aren't maybe the, the kind of sexy thing of the day and to really be the voice of social critique. And I'm so happy that Aaron Trammell is gonna be toy. oh, it's my big picture thing. But I'm so happy to say that Aaron Trammell is going to be, officially is now a tenured faculty. So well, I mean, Aaron has been here for many years, but welcome to being a tenured professor. We're so, so excited that you're here with us. The second major promotion moment in an academic's career is the move from assistant professor to full professor. This is something that I didn't know going to academia, but anytime you see anybody who says, hi, I'm professor Melissa Masmanian, or if it's on my, like the bottom of my email, it says Melissa Masmanian professor. That means you're a full professor. You're technically not allowed to call yourself professor until you have your, you're a full professor. Before that, you are an assistant professor, which is weird for the outside world because you're actually nobody's assistant. Mm -hmm. um, or you're an associate professor, which is um, kind of code for you have tenure, but you're not a full professor. That's weird. It's, it's a bit archaic. But it's still a big deal to be promoted to full professor. And the rank of full professor is supposed to suggest that you have national and international reputation as a leading person in your field, that you are at the cutting edge of really affecting what is known about your space of interest. And I'm very happy that you, Nan Chen, is our newest full professor. No, 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 no. <laughs> so these were our two major promotions from last year. Hopefully I'll be staying here next year with a lot more on these slides. We have a big merit and promotion cycle this fall. So. I also wanna welcome Mohammed. Mohammed is Associate Professor of Teaching. So he is coming here with tenure. And Mohammed is gonna be, Mohammed's been here for six months, but he didn't get to sit in this room last year when I said he was gonna come <laughs> because he joined us in January. And so I wanted to put you up again because I get to look at you and say, welcome. So Mohammed is going to be associate professor of software engineering. He's going to be teaching a lot of our software engineering courses, both to our undergrads as well as to our master's student in software engineering. So we're so happy to have you. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and last but not least, I'm going to put this up every year until Or decides not to work with us anymore, <laughs> which hopefully won't be anytime soon. So Or Schrock is an independent researcher, editor, and author. Do you have a lot of money 
and you want somebody to help you write your book or edit your book or help you structure your book or whatever, you pay or to do it. Many of us have done this. It's just how we got to know them. But or is an independent writing consultant. They do have a PhD and they actually have expertise in our world. So they have expertise in software engineering, HCI, and some STS. And they have helped many of our faculty and faculty outside of our department really get their writing up to speed. That's their job. And they're very good at it. We have hired, or now I think this is going to be our third or fourth year, I don't think anyone really remembers, as a informatics writing coach. We pay them. We pay them for 10 hours a week to just help our PhD students become better writers. And once again, we are the only department on campus who does this. You can go to the writing center. The writing center is great. There's nothing wrong with the writing center. I would absolutely encourage you to go to the writing center actually for also help with grammar and spelling and, and you know, kind of sentence structure. Or can do that, but or can do a lot more. So what they can also do is really think about how am I framing my paper? Is my research question coming through? Do I have a logical you know, strand to my argument? So they have office hours that you can just sign up for and 10 hours a week of their life is dedicated to you. So if you don't use them, it's on you. <laughs> this is a resource that we highly encourage you to use. I've had many, many, many positive feedback, both from students and from faculty, right? So I've had students come to me and say, Melissa, I met with Orr, but I don't think I'm using my time with you well. <laughs> As a faculty member, that's like the most amazing thing a student can ever say. They are learning what role I can play in their educational experience, but also learning what other kind of forms of mentorship and advice and how to become a better writer, both with me, but also outside of me. So they're coming to me with more strategic questions and help me with this. It's fabulous. So I would highly encourage students to visit, or how many here have visited? I saw some nods heading over here. Yeah. So wonderful, wonderful resource. And again, if you don't use it, you're the only person to blame. I don't want the money we're, we're paying on them to go to waste. Not that it is, but you know what I mean? Like it's there, the resource is there. And you are the only students in UCI who have a private writing coach. This is because we've learned over and over that what we do as academics, what you do as students, is right. It's our job. Yeah, you can think good thoughts. I encourage you to think good thoughts. I encourage you to do cool research. I encourage you to learn how to collect data and you know be rigorous in your analysis of that data. That's all fine. And very more than fine. It's very important. <laughs> but if you can't write it down in a coherent, eloquent, and rigorous way, you are not going to be an academic. That's what we do. It's critical. And so much of us think like, oh, I'm really smart and interested and excited, so therefore I'm gonna be a great PhD student. It's only halfway there. Yeah, you need all those things. But so, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I think it's super important. And I'm very proud that we have this resource for you. Okay. So I want you to know that when I make these slides about some of the cool projects going on every year, there's like 30 more slides I could put up here. There is so much cool stuff going on in your individual projects, in the research labs that are run by the various faculty members in informatics, um, and then some of the individual projects that our faculty members are up to, and the individual projects that, that our graduate students are up to. There is such cool research going on in informatics, I can't even begin to tell you. So I just picked a smattering, um, and there'll be a different smattering next year, and there was a different smattering last year, but they are, it's just really interesting stuff. So today I wanted to bring up a little bit about what's going on in our Accessibility Research Collective, and that is with Stacey Branham and Anne Marie Piper, who run this collective. They have a relatively new accessible lab, first accessible lab, um, on the fifth floor, and they are doing a suite of interesting things with their students. This is somebody who's working with them. It's a blind parent or visual disability disabled parent who is using a YouTube video to read with their daughter. So thinking about what does it mean to be disabled is a very broad definition, but also the people who have been kind of labeled as disabled can, should, and need to be integrated into all aspects of family, work, and society. And these are the people that are really trying to figure out how to do that beyond just designing a tool. 
beyond just throwing a tool at somebody and saying, you know, now you can function differently. That is never going to be sufficient. So really thinking more broadly about how do we integrate people from a variety of, you know, physical and cognitive abilities into society. Outside stuff, this is a big picture of their lab going to a local high school where they're learning about accessibility projects. A bunch of other interesting things coming out of this lab. Also, I wanted to highlight our capstone program. So our undergraduates, every single undergraduate in informatics goes through a capstone course. We have a giant capstone expert in this expo in the spring. Come. It's actually really, really cool. I, I was asked to be a judge last year. So I got I had like the, the motivation to talk to people and get to know what they were doing. Some of the most interesting capstone projects. These are undergrads who take a two quarter sequence with one of our capstone faculty, and they are out there building stuff and creating stuff and working with local partners. I see a couple of our capstone faculty right over here in the corner, Matt, Hadar, and Darren. Um, it's really cool stuff. So this is just one of the approximate, Hadar and I think it's approximately 75 projects a year, give or take. That's a lot. So approximately 75 projects a year, but this is one, this is a this is an innovator, an entrepreneur, Craig Carroll, that we've worked with for many years. He brings in new ideas, he brings in lots of connections. He's super excited to work with students. They've been working on one capstone project, it's called Get Mentored, which is an online platform to help students explore careers and connect with mentors. They currently have 1,500 career exploring videos, as well as a whole networking capability. So it's really interesting stuff. This, unlike this, which has been well, kind of, it's a well-honed machine, not a machine, but it's a well-honed system. We've been doing capstones for many years. On the other side, we have some brand new exploratory and experimental experiences for our undergraduate students. And one is a brand new class that Andre Vanderhoek has established. It was the kind of inaugural class last year for both our master's and undergrad students, where they are building um, virtual reality games to solve social problems. There was only 16 students in it last year. They loved it. We're doing it again this year. Um, Tim or Tim Cascini is a director and storyteller who comes in to think, how do you integrate people? How do you build tools that will get people to want to play and want to engage in order to solve big problems? It's really, really cool. Here's a few of the examples. This one is like, it's a very complex kind of incentive structure where you have droppy, an animated water drop, and then you learn about how to kind of think about water, but not in this very didactic teaching like save water kind of way. But then if you if you care for droppy well, you get these animated virtual um, like pets, and then you're rewarded kind of, so it's kind of integrating the pet virtual pet games with a water saving game. This one is more kind of virtual reality in the, physical world because it's a bee sim simulator game where you, you support your beehive by collecting network from the nectar from different areas. And this is an escape room game called Toxicity Rising, <laughs> where you get a warning that you're in an escape room and you're in a factory, a sinking car factory. And so you have to get your way out. These just came out of undergrad and master's program class last year. It's just really cool. That's some of the stuff that our faculty are doing on a pedagogical front that I wanted to share with you. Also, our faculty are amazing scholars. <laughs> and sorry, Erin, I had to put this picture up of you. It's so funny. Erin, <laughs> um, okay, the way that it works when you do scholarship, some of us write journal articles, some of us write conference papers, some of us write books. Books take a while and they are very large pieces of engaged scholarship. But they also can, you know, there can be stops and starts depending on the editors and the publisher. So Aaron was working on two books kind of simultaneously, one at a time. And by coincidence, they both came out within months of each other. So he went, he has published two books in the last year. Please don't try and do this at home. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. None of the rest of us are ever going to publish two books in a year. And Aaron, if you do it again, I don't even know what. I will, <laughs> it will blow my mind. It is not common to publish two books in a year. <laughs> um, but Aaron did. They both came out last year. They're both fabulous. And actually, one of the interesting things about them is that they, they tell a little bit of a coherent story. So the book, The Privilege of Play, is a historical look into how did play as a, as a construct, kind of how was that embedded in a hegemonic culture where only certain people were allowed to be hobbyists and define what play was. 
and those those people are generally white men. So it's like it becomes an exclusionary definition of what play is from a historical perspective. And then Aaron moves into repairing play, which is a black phenomenology of thinking about what would play look like from a more kind of BIPOC people of color and different background perspective. Does play always have to be aggressive? Does it always have to be about winning? Does it always have to be, you know, these clear incentives can be moody. There has always been a dark side of play. And this is where we're trying to pull this out and think about it. Did I do that okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could ask him, but sometimes, but it's sometimes harder to tell your own book, right? We'd get the full thesis if you told us. But I encourage you to read these books, to pick them up, to talk to Aaron. They're both fabulous piece of scholarship and just genuinely very interesting. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. And this is just a great cover, by the way. Mm -hmm. Someone who wrote a book and still doesn't like the cover of my book, I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. Also, Mimi Ito. Mimi Ito is a faculty member in our department, but she actually sits and runs something called the Connected Learning Lab, which is the top place across the country and globe for understanding kind of connected teens and youth in a connected age. So she has a new book that she played a big role in editing, which is the essays and challenges and risks of designing algorithms and platforms for children. So thinking about what does it mean to have algorithmic justice when children and teens are the object of, um, of the design or the audience the design is then affecting. Gloria Mark, who is recently retired, I encourage you to come in December. We're gonna have a big retirement party. She has been in this department since before I got here. I don't know what year she started. Does anyone know? 2004, 2005, something around. What's that, you know? 2001. So she was a faculty member in our department for 23 years or 22 years. She's retiring. She's not slowing down. She wants to write more books. She's a wonderful resource. And her long-term interest has been on kind of the science of attention um, and distraction, which has become, as you can imagine, a complicated and probably more challenging arena with the emergence of digital media. So she wrote a book that was really a retrospective of research on attention has become quite a big hit. I had to put this up here just so Gloria ever sees these slides. Do you know this is? <laughs> this is Dak Shepard. He's like a big deal in Hollywood. He's married to Kristen Bell. But he has this code, this podcast called, what is it called? Armchair Expert. Armchair Expert, where he brings in lots of like Hollywood people, but also top thinkers of the day. I think it's pretty cool. Gloria, that's Gloria. Gloria's an armchair expert. I don't know. She's also been in the news and done a bunch of really probably more kind of, you know, official things. But the fact that she was an armchair expert, I thought I got a kick out of that. She sounds really good, too. I listened to the podcast. Um, also, we have some awards. Every year we tend to get, I'm sure this is not coincidence, but we tend to get a smattering of innovation and teaching awards. These are across the university. For some reason, they keep coming to our faculty. How is that possible? Maybe because they really care about teaching. But Anne Marie Piper got the Digital Accessibility Innovator Award, which makes sense given her focus in the Accessibility Research Lab that I was talking about. Um, and she is looking at kind of thinking about how disabled students experience education and what we can do to better serve them. And she got an award for that. Yunnan Chen got our Dean's Award for Graduate Education and Mentoring. I don't know if you remember, but Yunnan is our Vice Chair for Undergrad Affairs. So why is she getting a Dean's Award for Graduate Education and Mentoring? Because she is an amazing advisor. <laughs> And she is an amazing advisor whose students have repeatedly done amazing things and gone on to amazing jobs. So this is her as a faculty member and advisor getting recognized for the role she is playing in the lives of her PhD students. And she's also doing a great job as your undergraduate advice chair, so she kind of does it all. <laughs> Constance Steinkuhler got the Dean's Honoree in Excellence for Undergraduate Teaching. So Constance is uh, focus mostly on our game design and interactive media program and doing a lot of innovative, innovative things with our undergraduates in game design about how do we actually teach and engage game design and interactive media as a kind of not just a technical question, but also around narratives and, and um, social impact. I had to get a different picture of you, Nan, because she's in here too much. So <laughs> now we're going to move into distinctions in terms of external distinctions of your faculty, which do matter because what they suggest is that your faculty are really well, highly regarded by their peers outside of this institution. 
So Yunnan was just elected to the, is a fellow. If you don't know what a fellow means, uh, many of our top conferences and organizations at the, in different disciplines have a, a fellows. And it just means you're really cool. Like it means you you're known over time as someone who continually contributes top quality research to that space. And it usually means you're elected by your peers, which is a big deal. So Union was elected as a fellow of the American Colleague of Colleague. Is that right, Union? College. I I just typed a type wrong. American College of Medical Informatics. Jillian Hayes and her all of her spare time of not being the vice provost for graduate affairs, actually was elected to be the CRA board of directors. That might sound boring, like, oh, she goes to send a board member meeting, but CRA is the Computing Research Association. They shape, they really do shape the educational experience of, of computer science research across the country. It's actually quite a big deal to have someone in our department on the board of CRA. They, they have high level conversations and influence about the future of computer science research. It's really a big deal. Sean Young was recently elected to be advisor for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the Division of Health and Medicine. So these are the people making big decisions <laughs> about health and medicine and where resources go. It's also a big deal. Okay, so you've heard enough about our faculty, right? Should we go to our students? You guys are doing such cool things. So I wanna call out quite a few of our doctoral students for getting quite prestigious awards. First of all, Inkyung, how do I, I wanna say, I know I was practicing before, Inkyung? Inkyung. Inkyung, who tends to go by Joe. Are you here, Inkyung? No, she's in Korea. Oh, she's allowed to be in Korea. <laughs> Inkyung is, or Joe, is uh, the 2023, a2023 Google Fellow. This is a big deal. This means that Google as a company has decided to invest in our student and pay for their entire education for a few years. It's a really big deal, a very prestigious scholarship. And she is looking at technology-driven mental health services. Many of these people are in the room because they're off. They're off doing the things that their fellowships and scholarships are allowing them to do. Will Dunkel's not in the room because he is in Korea and he is one of five UCI students that was chosen as a Fulbright fellow. And he's gonna spend an entire year in Korea exploring how play becomes industrialized as part of the larger practice of a culture industry in Korea, which is one of the biggest exporters of culture into across the globe. So hi, Will. Out there in Korea, we're so proud of you. <laughs> Shi Lu got awarded as a rising star in EECS, which is Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. This is a program specifically for um, women, people who identify as women and trans women, um, who to for rising stars to be actually bringing people together to talk about career trajectories as a group. It's a very prestigious and wonderful thing to be part of. Bono got not one, but two awards this year. I could have given Bono two slides, but that felt a little excessive. <laughs> so Bono was awarded a public impact fellowship, as well as actually the very prestigious Presidential Dissertation Year Fellowship Program. There's only one or two a year, and it's a fully funded year to focus on your dissertation. And it's not chosen by us. It's chosen by the um, president of the UC system, I believe, or else the president of UCI. Anyways, beyond me, that's all I know. Mm -hmm. But it was very prestigious and we're excited for Bono to be able to focus on his dissertation this year. Maria got the Miguel Vasquez Scholarship. Mm -hmm. By the way, all these, I'm not gonna give you, cause we don't wanna be crass and give you like dollar amounts, but these all come with money, mm -hmm. okay? So if you see that the, if you see fellowships coming through either from our office, um, our graduate office or the university graduate office, go ahead and apply. Because you're going to see I'm going to go through about a ton of these right now, which means that a lot of the peer students here and a lot of your peers are really getting these wonderful fellowships. It's possible. Some of them come with a lot of money. Some of them come with $5,000, which is still a lot of money, actually, if you're going to put it in your pocket. Um, and they, they're to help you get to help you be a better student just by offsetting costs and to award and to recognize excellence. Hi, Mikhail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is what happens when you don't put a picture of yourself on the internet. I find one. So Mikhail got the Rose Hills Foundation Science and Energy Engineering Scholarship. Congratulations. Jesse 
with the Rosvala Gadero Valencia Graduate Award. Elizabeth, the Roberta Ellen Lamb Memorial Endowed Fellowship. Elizabeth is not with us right now because she is currently taking just a quarter off of her PhD. She studies to be an intern at the Microsoft African Research Institute, which is a really prestigious internship. So she's in Africa doing research with them. Yeah. Farouk got the Graduate Dean's Dissertation Fellowship Award. So this is awarded by Grad Division. Lucas, the Fred M. Tong Endowed Graduate Award. Kat, the Rob Kling Memorial Endowed Fellowship. Kat is not with us because they got this award right before they graduated. Yay, you can get them right before you graduate. And then Kat is currently a postdoc at the University of Michigan School of Information. Actually working with Oliver Hameson, who was a student here several years ago. So there's a nice informatics trajectory there. Sorry, Dennis. Dennis got the Arch Scholarship. This is a local Orange County uh, fellowship that I don't know why, but our students get them every year. They're not for our students, <laughs> but somehow we have really figured out how to, I'm looking, didn't you get one last year, Lucy? Yeah, so we've, we've figured out the secret to these arts fellowships. It's actually a good amount of money to be doing exciting research in the area. They, they don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have like a real focus. It's just you selling that your research matters from what I can tell. <laughs> It's supposed to be like, it's like promotes U.S. competitiveness by rewarding academic outstanding U.S. citizens. Uh, some of these awards are for citizens, some of them are not. So that's something to think about. Then get to the big money. <laughs> this one, I put the money down because it's so big, it's exciting. The big money is the fact that, did you know, and many of you do know this, that your faculty go out for and receive incredible research awards from our top funding institutions in the United States. And that's what pays for a lot of you to go here, right? So our big research, big research awards both help us further our research, also helps us support our students. So these, but you have to tell a very compelling and exciting research trajectory to get these awards. These awards suggest that they're voted up, they're discussed by your peers, there's actually NSF boards of review. I've served on them. Many of our faculty have served on them. Where we discuss each other's research proposals and decide, is it exciting? Is it doable? Is it worth giving a lot of money to? So these awards both are prestige and suggest the quality of your reputation and your kind of the quality of your research, as well as genuine resources that we need to do the research and to support our students as part of our research endeavor. So a big congratulations to Daniel right here. Daniel has a really, really exciting research trajectory on advancing personal well-being through everyday, meaningful, key. He knows I know. It. We've had a lot of talks about this. I'm not someone who weighs myself. I'm not someone who tracks my steps. I'm not someone who tracks my calories. I'm just not a quantitative person. But I would use some of Daniel's designs <laughs> because he is going beyond just your kind of simplistic ideas of quantitative self, um, which many of you might love. That's great. I just don't. But thinking about what would be meaningful data collection that you would get something from, and thinking kind of broadly about design. A few of the program, a few of the studies that he's proposed in his career grant are Fit Create, a web tool for customizing representations of activity data. So you're not just counting steps. Maybe it's how you feel, or maybe it's what site you got to see. So thinking about the customized interface so that you are being motivated by something that is potentially more than just steps. Food Together, a mobile app for families to journal shared eating experiences. I like this idea. I mean, I would use that. Um, an AT annotator, an annotation tool to support the discontinuation of antidepressants. And Daniel really wanted to make sure that his current students are all recognized as people who are already working and supporting this research trajectory. And I, you will see that a lot of these names are names I brought up throughout who students who are getting fellowships and having exciting opportunities. So this all goes together. You can see here the seeds of a really productive kind of research endeavor. We got, uh, we, I'm just gonna take credit for it, has nothing to do with me, but our faculty received a very large future of work grant from the NSF. And this is really interesting for me because if you didn't, if you don't know, these two, Andre and Iftikhar, are software engineering faculty, 
Madhu is a human computer interaction health faculty, and Stephen Stuhler is also more health and computer human interaction and social ecology. This is a true bridge between software engineering and HCI. And what they're gonna be looking at is improving software developer mental well-being. So people in this room sit at computers and write code. It's not all generative AI. It never will be all generative AI in my perspective. But anyway, there are people who are, it's a giant industry of people who write code and do software design, not just write code, but also design and structure systems through code. They're humans. And they actually have a lot of challenges from a mental health and productivity perspective. So this is like this is to think about how what is the nature of this work and how can we support mental well-being of people doing this work, which I think is a really exciting kind of angle into the future of technology and software. We got not one but two future of work grants. This is very, very unusual. This is a small program at the NSF. And last year was the last year of the future of work program. Did you guys know that? So sad. Um, you and I were, no, not you and I was able to get a future of work uh, grant many years ago. But they're, they're just stopping the future of work grants, but we got two right before they stopped it. This is another take into the future of work. Now remember, these have to be focused on work because they're about the future of work. And in this one, Anne Marie Piper and Stacey Brennan, along with two other people here at UCI, Sharon Kotman is in our business school, and Eric Sudik is here in statistics, meaning here in our school as well as two people from Northwestern. So big, big group of people looking at what are tools that we need to design an inclusive workforce for accessible collaboration. So if you think about it, we've got more and more people working from home, working from a distance, kind of distance collaboration. Well, how does that work if you're visually impaired? So how do we support accessible collaboration uh, for those uh, with different degrees of sight? Sean Young, with a big group of people, you can see all the details here, got a more than $10 million grant to explore, it's called Exploring, Predicting, and Intervening on Long-Term Viral Suppression Electronically. And the point of this research, or the goal of this research, is how to digitally recruit Black and Latinx people living with HIV in order to improve their care. That's some, this is some cool stuff, right? You can see where they're getting funded. This is a big deal. I'm almost done, I know we're at three. I could not stop that without recognizing this is a big moment for informatics. We have our first two of many, but the first two black women to graduate from our department with PhDs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ted Johnson and Lucretia Williams were a wonderful, wonderful part of our student body. They're both going on. Lucretia is currently going to Howard and Gisette to University of Michigan in research positions. And they have, I think, they they were not only are they trailblazers and just wonderful people to work with, but they have made this department a place where more people of color and black women feel like they can find a home here. So I personally credit them for a lot of the kind of increase we've had in people feeling like informatics is a good place to do a PhD. So you got to have trailblazers to change culture. And these are some of our trailblazers, and I'm very proud of both of them. I also just really like both of them, so that helps too. I won't go into all of the details. I'll send you the slides. But I just want you to know and remember that our PhD students go out and do incredible things. You can't tell that from the lists of where they're working. But the practical side of you might want to know, where are our students getting jobs? Well, they're getting really good jobs. And they're getting great jobs both in academia and in industry. So one of the beautiful things about our department is you as a student can really have an honest and genuine multiple career trajectories. I did not. When I went to grad school, if you did not become a professor, you were seen as a failure. It just was. That's how it was. It is how it still is in many disciplines. It is not the way it is here. We have two vibrant, different career trajectories, and we have students in both of them. So meaning that we have a bunch of students going into academia, we have a bunch of students going into industry. There's pros and cons of these different trajectories, right? Financial, stability, longevity, what you're studying, whether or not you have a boss, pros and cons but you get to decide and we will help you get there. And I want you to know that there's very vibrant kind of career trajectories coming out of this program. Okay, 
you don't need to know all this because we're at three o'clock, but this art department is pretty complex. This is all of our degree programs, the undergraduate and graduate size. Currently in our graduate, because I figure we must have graduate students in the room, our informatics graduate program has 65 PhDs and six master's students. These are research master's students. The Stock Engineering has 30 PhDs and 17. These are with the current incoming class. Um, and then these are our professional degree programs, which you can, there's some more statistics about our two professional degree programs here. You're here, so you know about this seminar series. <laughs> Okay, but I encourage you to come back to people who are going to be telling you about their work and not just about the department. We have a wonderful, wonderful um, series. And in an unusual coincidence, but one that I'm very happy about, we actually have one, two, three of our own talking this quarter. We oftentimes say, what are, what are you doing? We're so busy being faculty that we don't know what each other are up to on a research side. And so for a number, just more coincidence than anything, we got a lot of people. So Roderick, Daniel and Gloria and her retirement celebration are going to be telling us about their current work. But we also have um, Samer. Oh, and Samer, Samer is from computer science. A lot of people from UCF. Yeah. And Giovanni coming in. We have these throughout the whole year. Usually they're more external people, but I think it's actually exciting that it's ourselves, it's us ourselves. Okay, I'm gonna just, I know that we're over, but I just want to say a couple things. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that we are not living in easy times. We may be in the room because we're not worried or we're less worried <laughs> that a global pandemic is going to, you know, destroy us tomorrow, but it's still there. We've got international wars that are still going on. We have political upheaval. We're about to cross the globe. We're about to enter the U.S. presidential race. It is a hard time. And you all are living in it. We all are living in it. And I think we just need to acknowledge that and remember that when we're doing something very challenging, like a PhD or a master's or attempt to be a faculty member, <laughs> this is our world and the only way we're gonna manage it is together. So I just think it's really important to remember that we are all human, including the people running your university. We are all scared. I can say confidently that we actually all do care about social justice, at least those in our department. And we're all trying to succeed and thrive. And that's everybody around you. So if you feel that way, you are not alone. And I think it's important to know to acknowledge that. But I love informatics. <laughs> and I can say this with, without cynicism. I have been in this apartment since 2009. I have not moved. That is unusual in academia. And it's not, I promise you, because I didn't have options to move. <laughs> There are many points where I could have, but I chose to stay because I, uh, I love my colleagues. This is an unusual interdisciplinary space. Being truly interdisciplinary is hard. You have to manage all these different people from different perspectives who care about different things. But it's also amazing because you get cross collaboration. You look at problems differently. You have people who aren't like you, but who you respect. And that is what I feel about this department. And I really do believe, uh, we just came out of a faculty retreat, so I could come out of that faculty retreat feeling quite cynical and not friendly about the rest of my faculty members. And I had the opposite experience <laughs> in our faculty retreat. I really truly believe that everyone around me cares about scholarship and they care about each other. And that's, that's the faculty that you get to work with. Um, and I see every day, I see real and honest attempts to make this department inclusive. And that is more than just a diversity ambassador who increases our pipeline. That's about you coming here and finding a home where you can thrive. Doesn't always work, but we're trying. Um, my colleagues really care about education. You know that we're not actually all that incentivized by being good teachers, honestly. We're not, we're incentivized by being good researchers but we care about being good teachers. We have a lot of conversations about teaching. I see people going above and beyond to design their classes in ways that are gonna be active and engaged. And this is in a moment where ICS is, is exploding students. I met with the Dean yesterday and they were just telling me about statistics that show that our applications to the school of ICS have gone up 400% in the last decade. That means people wanna be here, that's great. But it also means that we have to find a way to educate them in a real way. 
And our faculty and students are asking hard questions. We are doing the kind of scholarship that is fundamental. We are the people who are going to help society handle digital media, technology, AI, all of it. If we're not gonna do it, I really don't know who is. So it's a big responsibility, but it's really important. I'll tell you, my son, who's nine, came home and was crying the other day. He doesn't cry that much anymore. It's not that he was really crying. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And it was because his fourth grade class is doing a unit on climate change. And it got him. It got him big. This is a nine-year-old who's recognizing the world that we're in. And all I could tell him was that, yes, humans have really messed up, but we're also really good problem solvers. And we are in a moment where we have to become problem solvers. And I think that's true for a lot of our social issues and environmental issues and technical issues. And the people here in this department who are here, who are paid and driven to ask the hard questions and solve the hard problems is exactly what we need as a society. So I just want to acknowledge that because that's why you're all here, okay? So I'm gonna draw, stop there. Say thank you for coming. We have a lovely outside reception. So come have a drink, have a snack, get to know each other and hopefully we'll have a great year. So thank you.